Hello students and welcome back to Political Science 1513.w1 American Federal Government Online. As always, I am your professor and in this video we are going to begin our lecture on political parties. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at our learning objectives. Learning objective number one asks for you to describe the three faces of a political party and to identify examples of the types of people that would fall into each of these categories. Number two asks for you to detail the main activities of the American political party. Number three asks for you to discuss the ways in which we use political parties to inform who we vote for and help us to control government. And then finally, we're going to end with our fourth learning objective, where I ask for you to break down the current realities of America's party system and the major factors which help to explain why we have this particular system. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about that first of the four learning objectives. The first learning objective, remember, asks for you to describe the three faces of the modern American political party. The three faces of the modern American political party are the party in government, the party in the electorate, and the party organization, or pig, pie, and po. Now we're going to talk about each of these in turn, but before we do, let's start with an overview. I want you to understand that, generally speaking, we tend to talk about parties as though they are unitary actors. A unitary actor is an individual or a group of individuals that operates with a single goal, a single set of priorities, and a single understanding of how best to go about achieving that goal or those priorities. But what we're going to find is that political parties aren't unitary. They can be subdivided into groups that have their own sets of interests, their own ideas, their own priorities, and their own beliefs about how best to go about achieving these goals. And generally speaking, what we're going to find is that there are three major groups of individuals. There are three major faces in the parties that control our government. So whether we're talking about Republicans or Democrats, we are going to find that there is a party in government, a party in the electorate, and a party organization. And these three groups of individuals operating within each of the major parties are going to have their own sets of priorities. Sometimes they're going to work together, and sometimes they're going to benefit from that cooperation. But in other cases, they're going to compete with each other. And in other cases, they're going to find it more in their own interest to fight with one another than to work together as a team. So let's talk a little bit about what each of these three faces is comprised of and what goals each of these three faces is going to pursue. We'll start with the party in government. The party in government is comprised of every elected official or other government individual who affiliates with a political party. So in other words, if an individual is going to identify as a Republican, but also holds a government position at the state, local, or federal level, that individual is a part of the Republican pig. An example of this might be a bureaucrat who works with the EPA, but is also a registered Republican. On the flip side, if we wanted to look at a very glaringly obvious example of a part of the Republican pig, we could talk about President Donald Trump. He holds a position in the United States government, and he's a Republican. Therefore, he is a part of the Republican pig. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got, say, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, she holds a seat in Congress, and she's also a Democrat. Therefore, she's a part of the Democratic pig. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she holds a seat on the United States Supreme Court. She's a Democrat, so she's a part of the Democratic pig. Just understand that if you hold a position in government, it doesn't really matter what that position is, you become a part of a party's pig the moment you begin to identify or affiliate with that party. That does not require you to get elected, so the party in government does also include unelected bureaucrats, judges, justices, so on and so forth. And whether we're talking about the appointed, the hired, or the elected government official, the party in government's job is to basically take the party's platform, its issue positions, and translate those into public policy. So remember from prior lecture that a political party is really just a group of political activists who organize to win elections, control government, and promote public policy. Well, these are the people that are actually controlling the government, that are actually creating those public policies, that are taking the party's promises and platform and communicating those into actual policy output. That's their job.
But do also remember that each individual has to keep their position. And sometimes that means that they're not going to cooperate with the party to the extent that the party and the electorate might want or that the party organization might expect. For example, if you're a Democrat from a southern state, it might be difficult for you to get away with voting for abortion. Because even though your party and the electorate would like for you to support abortion, and even though your party organization's published platform says that you will do so, your voters might have other priorities. And so what we're going to find is that lots and lots of Democrats who are elected in southern states have a tendency to vote pro-life. Similarly, Republicans in northern states have a tendency to vote pro-choice, even though their party in the electorate doesn't generally like this, and their party organization actively condemns it. So that's the party in government. Again, their job is to control the policy output of our government in a way that is as consistent with the platform of the party as they can get without risking their position, without risking re-election or getting fired. Next, we've got the party and the electorate. And this is hands down the largest of the three faces. The party and the electorate is comprised of anybody in the general public who identifies with or affiliates with or who has registered with the political party. So your next door neighbor who says, I am a Republican or I am a Democrat, I am a Libertarian or I am a member of the Green Party. Well, he or she is probably trying to tell you that they are a part of their party's pie or party in the electorate. Generally speaking, here's a rule of thumb. If somebody identifies with a political party, or if they consistently support that party's candidates, but they don't hold a position in government, and they hold no formal position in the political party's bureaucratic structure, he or she is a part of the pie. The party in the electorate is primarily responsible for selecting the party's candidates through primary elections and through uh, for establishing the party's platform by voting on whether or not to approve proposed policy platforms or agendas. However, I want you to understand that the party in the electorate tends to have its own set of ideas about what's best for the government. So, for example, they tend to prioritize candidates that are very far left if they're Democrats or very far right if they are Republicans. Whereas the party organization and the party in government might not be quite as comfortable with such extremism. And to explain why, let's take a moment to talk about what the party organization, or POE, is comprised of, as well as what the party organization is really there to do. The party organization can be thought of as the bureaucratic or corporate structure of the party. So the party organization is basically everybody who holds an official position with the party. That could be a volunteer, or it could be somebody who actually is hired by and receives a paycheck from the party organization. It could be a foot soldier who counts ballots during primary election season, or it could be a member of the Republican National Committee or the Democrat National Committee doesn't really matter. If you hold an official position with a political party, you are a part of that political party's PO, or party organization. So Debbie Weiserman Schultz, former chair of the Democratic National Committee, was a part of the Democrat Party organization. And the Democratic Party organization's job is to basically put together the various primary elections and events as well as to court, maintain, and communicate with a pool of party donors who will supply money to the party organization so that it can use this money to execute its activities and keep its party in government in power by electing candidates, by defeating the other side, or by retaining incumbents. So the party organization is there to organize and fundraise for the party's overall efforts. Generally speaking, the party organization's priority isn't really to push the values articulated by the party's official platform. The party organization's job is to keep the party alive, to make sure that it's able to win elections and control government for practical purposes. So what we're going to find is that sometimes the party organization and the party and the electorate have different ideas about, say, who should win in a primary election. Now remember, the party organization is responsible for doing things like counting ballots and actually getting everyone together and deciding how the primary election will be carried out. But the results of the primary election are at least in theory supposed to be decided by the votes cast by the party and the electorate. 
so the party organization is not supposed to control the outcome. Nevertheless, as we saw in 2016, there are definitely instances in which the party organization tries to affect the outcome of a primary election during which the party and the electorate is casting ballots to decide who their party will run in a general election. And the reason that this is going to happen is that the party organization's priority is to recruit and run candidates that can actually win. Whereas the party and the electorate is primarily driven by political values, beliefs, and ideas or interests that they want to see represented in government. And a good example of this can be found by looking at the 2016 Democratic primary election for President of the United States. Remember, during the 2016 Democratic primary, the Democratic Party and the electorate was brought together by the Democratic Party organization to cast votes to decide who their party would run as its candidate in the general election. Would they run Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton? Now, the party and the electorate kind of had a thing for Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders is a pretty far left candidate and the Democratic Party and the electorate tends to be very far left. Conversely, I'll go ahead and note, the Republican Party and the electorate tends to be very far right. So the party and the electorate tends to like some fairly extreme candidates, but the party organization tends to be leery of those candidates because they're ideologues who might not be as easily managed and because they also want to make sure that whoever they run will be able to win in a general election, during which period they'll have to attract not just their extreme partisan voters, but independents, third party members, and moderates. So the party organization in 2016 favored Hillary Clinton as a comparatively moderate candidate, whereas the party in the electorate favored the comparatively ideological Bernie Sanders. And so there was a big fight, and as it turned out, the party in the organization was able to win this fight. Hillary Clinton ultimately won the presidential nomination. Now, I don't want to overstate that. She might have won anyway. She also had a lot of support in the Democratic Party and the electorate. But the point here is that there was a fight, that the party and the electorate wanted one candidate and the party organization wanted another candidate because they have different priorities. So the bottom line here is that while we tend to say Republicans did this or Democrats think that as though they were unitary actors, political parties are actually tripartite. They are comprised of three groups or faces, the pig, the pie, and the po. And these three groups of individuals operating within the respective political parties often compete with one another, even though they could probably better pursue their interests by cooperating. And they often compete because they are made up of different people who have different priorities, goals, and ideas. But let's talk now about the main activities of any functioning political party in the United States. And as you can see from the slide, there are five main activities of a functioning political party. The first of the five major activities of a functioning political party is to recruit candidates. They need to find people to run for office, and they need to convince people who are currently in office to stay there. Quite frequently, what you will find is that the political parties will attempt to keep an incumbent in office, regardless of how the incumbent has voted on certain issues. And that's because Republicans and Democrats both recognize that incumbents, the people who are currently in office, are much more likely to win if they run for re-election than would be any candidate running against an incumbent or for an open seat. So they do definitely try to retain current incumbent candidates so that they don't have to find somebody or risk losing the seat to the other side. With that being said, when they are sent to find new candidates, they do suddenly start to think about things like the values or the particular interests that that particular candidate will represent. So generally speaking, here's what I want you to understand about the first major activity. When they are recruiting candidates, the parties have two big priorities. Number one, they want candidates that are viable. In other words, they want a candidate who actually stands some chance of winning in this particular race. Number two, they want candidates that are manageable. They don't want dark horse candidates or ideologues who will push their own values or agendas or prioritize the voters that they are supposed to represent. 
They want candidates that will do what the party establishment tells them to do so that they can make sure that each of their individuals in government are working not for their own best interest, not for the best interest of their particular voters, but for the best interest of the party as a whole. And so, again, they do want candidates who can win, but they also want candidates who they can control and that's really what they're going to be looking for as they fulfill this first major function. The second major function of a functioning political party is to assist candidates in running their campaigns. But I'm going to briefly note that this is less true than it used to be. It used to be that political parties were the most important force in running a candidate's campaign, but changing technology and things of that nature have really made our elections more candidate-oriented. Candidates are able to hire their own independent campaign consulting companies, their own independent campaign teams. They're able to secure their own media attention through force of personality or by mobilizing their own personal resources. And so they don't rely as heavily on the political parties as they used to. But during general elections, they do, to at least some extent, count on the political parties to help them raise money, turn out voters, so on and so forth. So while the parties are no longer running campaigns, they do still assist in the running of campaigns. And that is one of their major functions. Their third major function is to present voters with policy alternatives. And they're going to do this by publishing platforms. Now remember the platforms are technically written by people who will probably fall in the party organization category, but they have to be approved and can be amended by votes of the party in the electorate. And a platform is basically just a list of issue positions. So for example, as you can see on your screen, I've taken some excerpts from both the Democratic Party platform and the Republican Party platform. Now I'll note that even at the time of this recording, this is a little bit dated. Doesn't matter. What you need to understand is that both parties have published a list of issue positions, values, and ideas, and they're going to take a position on any major problem that people care about. So in this example, I'm comparing the Democratic Party platform's positions on abortion, energy, taxation, and national security to those of the Republican Party. And you can find all of this information on the internet if you like, but here's what you need to understand. When the parties publish their platforms, they're making a promise. They are promising voters that if those voters will simply put their people in power, they will then guide those people to take these promised positions and translate them into actual policy. So looking at the issue of abortion, the Democratic Party says that it strongly and unequivocally supports Roe versus Wade and a woman's right to choose safe legal abortion, regardless of her ability to pay. So what they're telling you is that if you elect Democrat candidates, they will push for policies that provide tax funding to ensure that women are able to obtain abortions if they would like to do so, even if those women are indigent and unable to afford to pay for the abortion out of their own pocket. Whereas the Republican platform has a very different idea. It says, we assert the inherent dignity and the sanctity of all human life and affirm, and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental individual right to life, which cannot be infringed. So what the Republican platform is telling you in its position statement for the issue of abortion is that if you elect Republicans, you can expect to see policies that provide equal protection for the prenatal segment of the population's right to life. So they will try to protect the life of the unborn, whereas the Democratic platform says that's not our priority. We're going to try to protect the woman's right to choose. And based on which of these positions you find more appealing, based on which set of values you find more similar to your own, you can choose which party to support. So parties present policy alternatives by publishing platforms. And if you like the set of issue positions articulated by the Democrats, you can vote for a Democrat candidate when you go to cast your ballot. If you like the Republican Party's platform, then you can vote for Republicans. And you know more or less what you're probably going to get. Of course, you also have to account for individual differences from one candidate to the next. But again, generally speaking, Republicans push Republican policies, Democrats push Democrat policies, and voters are aware of this. So we can use these party platforms 
to identify the policy alternatives that we're really being asked to choose from during illegal uh, or during election season. Next, what we're going to find is that when they are in power, parties have to actually operate government. So if Republicans take control of both chambers of Congress and the White House, as they did in 2016, it becomes their job to push that platform into policy. But there is a fifth major function that we need to talk about, and that's to oppose the party in power when a particular political party does not have control. So again, in 2016, the Republicans took control of the House of Representatives, the United States Senate, and the White House. But in 2018, Democrats took control of the House of Representatives. Now understand that the Republicans do still have the House and they still have the presidency. But even though they are overall in power, now the Democrats have a toehold. And so the Democrats are basically at a point in their history where their primary function is to impede the progress of the party in power. Their job is to keep President Trump from gaining any wins and to prevent the Republican Party from doing too much, quote unquote, damage. Because remember, every time the Republican Party achieves part of its policy platform, that's going to contradict or challenge parts of the Democrat platform. And even if there is a place where the Republicans and Democrats agree, the Democrats don't want the Republicans to get credit for pushing these new policies into practice. So they impede the progress of the party in power. And by the way, the opposite is also true. There was a time during which the Democrats were in power and the Republicans were the party out of power and they did everything they could to impede the Democrats, say, under President Barack Obama. But again, that's kind of what they're supposed to do. A part of pushing for the party's platform is preventing the opposite party from achieving its goals when you don't have the power to achieve your own. So taken together, these are the five major functions of any active political party in the United States. But I also want you to understand that we, the voters, use political parties to our own advantage in certain ways. They are useful to us in certain ways. And we're going to talk about that now. So the first thing I want you to understand, and probably the most important thing about political parties, is that they serve as a type of political cue. So voters use political parties as a political cue. A political cue is a piece of information that helps a person decide how to vote in an election, given very little information about what is actually at stake in that election. And the most common type of political cue is the candidate's party ID. Generally speaking, we know that the Republicans tend to be more conservative and the Democrats tend to be more liberal. So if you know nothing else about the candidates, then you can usually choose which of those candidates is the best fit for you based on your own ideology according to their party ID. Now, again, this is not always true. There are some liberal Republicans and there are some conservative Democrats. And quite frequently, what you'll find is that a person who probably ought to be a Democrat is registered and running as a Republican or a person that probably ought to be a Republican is registered and running as a Democrat. And they're going to do this so that they can actually win their elections based on where they happen to be. But that's probably an exception to the general norm. By and large, if you vote Republican, you're going to get Republican policies. If you vote for a Democrat, you're going to get some fairly Democrat policies. And so what we're going to find is that political parties, the candidate's party ID, gives us a whole bunch of information about where a candidate most likely stands on a whole host of different issues. And we use that to help ourselves cast good votes without having to do a whole bunch of research because let's be honest, we've got other things going on. We have other priorities. And if we're honest, most of us are intellectually lazy and uneducated. And this isn't a judgment. It's just a simple observation. Most voters are operating on very low information. It's not because they're dumb. It's because they are what we will sometimes refer to in the political science literature as cognitive misers. A cognitive miser is a person who will attempt to find shortcuts or cues that help them to draw quick, easy conclusions without having to think too hard. So this is derived from what we call the cognitive miser model of human psychology, and I'll give you a definition for that as well. The cognitive miser model 
of human psychology is an understanding of human problem solving in which people attempt to find shortcuts or cues that help us to draw quick, easy conclusions without having to think or work too hard. In other words, what I'm telling you is that if you can figure out a problem in a really easy way, you are more likely to do so. Whereas if the only way to solve the problem is to engage in a great deal of work, then you'll do that work. So if there's a shortcut, you're going to take it. An example that I like to give at this point has to do with math. If I were to ask you to find the square root of 612, you probably wouldn't try to mentally calculate it even if you knew how. You would go and grab a calculator. Well, we do that with political parties and elections. So political parties are basically like brand names. If you think about going into a Walmart and trying to buy toilet paper, it might be that you are on a budget and so you want to get the most affordable toilet paper possible. You want to get the biggest bang for your buck. You want to buy the toilet paper that is going to have a acceptable level of quality while nevertheless giving you the lowest per unit price. But you're in a hurry. You don't have time to sit around looking at the per unit price on every tag. So you might instead simply run directly to what you understand from past experience to be the cheapest brand. Maybe that's the Walmart brand or the best choice brand. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that you understand from past experience that best buy brand or the Walmart brand is generally speaking going to be the cheap brand. Now that's not always true. Sometimes there will be another brand that is selling its toilet paper or other product cheaper than the Walmart brand. But most of the time the Walmart brand has a lower per unit price and so you can use that to make a generally safe decision and it will usually work. Not always. Ideally you would do the research. If you had the time and the energy you would do the research. But because we are cognitive misers, we've got other things to worry about, we've got other things to do, we don't have the time, energy, or motivation to research every single candidate in every single election on every single issue, we are instead going to use their party ID as a cue about which, uh, from which we can make some general deductions about a whole host of different issue positions. So again, we use political parties as political cues or brand names because we're cognitive misers and it helps us to make good decisions about who to vote for without having to do a whole bunch of research most of the time. We also use political parties as legislative cartels that help us to bridge the gap between branches of government and overcome the separation of powers. So remember from prior lecture that our government was designed to have separated powers that will also create a system of checks and balances to prevent the government from getting too big for its britches, from being too active, from creating too many laws, and from doing too much damage to the freedom of individuals. But that separation of powers, that system of checks and balances, while useful for protecting us from tyranny, can also in some cases be a little bit frustrating. Because when you create a whole bunch of checks and balances, it makes it really easy for people to interfere with us when we're trying to achieve our goals or push for policies that help to solve problems with which we are dealing. And so political parties have evolved over time to serve as a legislative cartel, which will help us to take control of the government and to work around the checks and balances so that we can actually get some things done. And again, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing. That's a matter of opinion. It's up to you to decide. But to help you understand how political parties operate in this way, uh, let, let me give you a definition for the term legislative cartel. A legislative cartel is a term applied to the political party as a group of like-minded politicians which join together to control what types of legislation are introduced, approved, and passed into law. If you only have one or two people in Congress, you don't have enough force to control what laws are passing and what laws are failing because there are 535 total members and everything's going to be decided by a vote. And then, of course, you've got to deal with the Supreme Court and you've got to deal with the president who can veto legislation and you've got to deal with the state legislators. So if you really want to control 
public policy. If you really want to control legislation, you need to get a whole bunch of people elected across the country, across multiple different branches of government, across multiple different offices within each of the branches of government, and then you need them all to work together so that they can prevent the other side from pushing for their policies while nevertheless actively pursuing their own. And when they are trying to do this, when they're trying to control the various organs of government, the various parts of the legislator, we say that political parties are working as legislative cartels. And if they're going to achieve their goals that we, their voters, would like to see put into practice, they have to do this. So political parties, first and foremost, are used by voters as political cues so that we can cast good votes with low information. But they are also used by voters to serve as legislative cartels, which can help us to overcome the system of separated powers, checks and balances created by our Constitution, and actually achieve our legislative goals. But the next thing that we kind of need to start talking about is the system of political parties in our country. Because one thing that you're probably going to realize, even if you don't know much about polit politics in our country, is that we do operate on a two-party system. And to some extent, that's somewhat surprising. Why is it so surprising that we have a two-party system? Well, to answer that question, let's look a little bit at some demographic data. Let's look at how people identify in terms of partisan affiliation. Now, if I were to ask you which of the following is the largest, Republicans, Democrats, or Independents, most of you would probably say either Republicans or Democrats. And I understand why, because they are certainly the largest in government. They are certainly the two parties that get the most attention. But what we're going to discover is that the correct answer to this question in most points in time is going to be independence. Answer C. So again, these numbers are subject to variation. At the time of this recording, what we're going to find is that in the general public, about 30% of us will identify as Republicans, about 30% of us will identify as Democrats, and nearly 40% of us are going to identify as Independents. We don't affiliate with either the Republican or the Democratic political party. And again, this, this varies literally from month to month. I need you to understand these numbers are going to change. But they're not going to change too drastically. You can look at the data that I will link in this week's coursework folder, and you can find that the Gallup Institute gathers data on party ID every month of every year and has for decades. And pretty much every month of every year, we have seen for decades that independents consistently outnumber either Democrats or Republicans. They are a plurality. Now, do understand they're not a majority. A majority is more than half. It's 51% or more. A plurality is just the largest group. So 40% of the American population is not a majority of the American population, but it is a plurality because that only leaves 60% to be divided more or less evenly between Republicans and Democrats. And I will pause to note, just in the sake of disclosure, that the Democrats do usually have a slight numeric advantage over Republicans, but that does vary from time to time. And it does seem to be, to some extent, changing. Republicans have been doing a little bit better in ID identification over the recent years. But the bottom line is that even when Republicans do well, they're outnumbered by independents. Even when Democrats do well, they are, generally speaking, outnumbered by independents. And yet you would never get that impression from watching our news. You would never get that impression from looking at our government. So, for example, if you look at the numbers presented on your slide, what you're going to find is that there are about 53 out of 100 senators who currently identify as Republican, and there are about 45 who currently identify as Democrat. Now, again, these numbers vary, and that does still leave two seats that are at least theoretically held by independents, but... That means that about half of the Senate is Republican and about half of the Senate is Democrat and virtually nobody in the Senate is really an independent, even though independents in the general public outnumber both Republicans and Democrats. So you would expect, therefore, that more of our elected officials would be independents than either Republicans or Democrats, but that's not true. And the reason, by the way, that I'm saying that there aren't really any meaningful independents in our government is that both of the independents in our government are going to be either current or former Democrat presidential candidates. In fact, Bernie Sanders, who I'm counting here as an independent, is technically at the time of this recording a Democrat. 
he re-registered as a Democrat so that he could run for president on the Democratic Party's platform. Now, we'll see how that turns out in the primary election season. Fine, whatever. But the other independent currently serving in our federal government is a guy named Angus King. And he, too, formerly ran as a Democratic candidate for president. Now, neither of these individuals has gotten the nomination of the Democratic Party, but both of them did formally choose to enter into that party when it was politically expedient for them to do so. And if you look at their voting records, you're going to find that they fairly consistently vote with the Democratic Party. They caucus with the Democrats. So if there's ever a vote that's going to fall along party lines where Democrats vote one way and Republicans vote the other, you can bet that these two quote-unquote independents are going to side with the Democrats and not the Republicans. So for all practical purposes, we don't really have any independents in our federal legislature. And in fact, what we're going to find is that we have more vacancies, more empty seats in the United States House of Representatives alone than we have independents in the entire federal government of elected officials. So independents are not, by and large, gaining any seats in Congress. They're not going to be getting the presidency anytime soon. They don't really get to appoint Supreme Court justices or secretaries for the various cabinet departments. And even at the state level, they do not do well. By and large, independents are a plurality of the general population, but essentially non-existent among our elected leaders. And that's because we've got a two-party system. A two-party system is a system of elections, or democracy, in which only two parties ever stand a real chance of winning elections or controlling government. Every once in a while, a third party might win a seat or two in isolation, but there is not any real probability that libertarians, for example, are going to take control of the United States federal government anytime in the near future. There is no real probability that a Green Party candidate is going to win our next presidential election. Our next president will either be a Republican or a Democrat. I don't know which, but it will be one or the other. And I would put all of my savings into that bet. Because, again, we have a two-party system where Republicans and Democrats consistently dominate in elections, even though they are outnumbered by independents. And to understand why this is true, we need to look at a concept called Duverger's Law. And I've spelled this out on the slide for you. I'll post some videos in this week's content folder to help you wrap your mind around Duverger's Law. But basically, Duverger's Law, spelt Duverger's Law, it's, it's French, Duverger's Law, tells us that countries with simple plurality or majority rule elections will tend towards having exactly two parties. So what does that exactly mean? What, what, what are we talking about when we say plurality or majority rule elections? Well, what I want you to understand is that a plurality or majority rules election is a winner-takes-all electoral system in which candidates are elected, usually from single-member districts, according to which candidate received the most votes, and the person who comes in second gets basically nothing in exchange. So here's something that needs to be in your notes. The number one most important cause of America's two-party system is our use of simple plurality elections. It is our use of single-member district elections with a winner-takes-all system of deciding who wins in the electoral outcome. In the United States, we use a plurality rather than a proportional electoral system. This means that candidates are given the opportunity to run for a seat in Congress or for some other office in government. Voters are going to cast ballots, one ballot per voter, according to which of the candidates they would like to win. And whichever candidate gets the most votes takes the prize, while the rest are sent home. Because there is no prize for second place, there is no participation trophy, this plurality, or winner-takes-all system of elections, incentivizes what we call strategic voting. Strategic voting is when voters cast their ballot in support of whichever candidate is most likely to defeat their least favorite option, rather than simply voting for the candidate that they would like to see the best. So, for example, in 2016, we can imagine a hypothetical voter who really, really likes the libertarian candidate for president, Gary Johnson. But that voter recognizes that Gary Johnson represents a party that is in an extreme minority and therefore doesn't stand a real chance of actually winning the presidency. 
that voter might recognize that in 2016, the only viable candidates were really Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, the Republican and the Democrat. So the voter isn't going to vote for Gary Johnson because he or she does not want to throw his or her vote away on a candidate that's going to lose, knowing that they will get nothing in return for having gone through the effort of supporting their favorite candidate. Consequently, this candidate will vote for either Clinton or Trump based on which of these two candidates the voter finds to be the least offensive. So maybe his ideal candidate is Gary Johnson, and he doesn't really like either Trump or Clinton, but he really, 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 really hates Hillary Clinton. So he'll vote Donald Trump, not because he likes Donald Trump, not because he wants Donald Trump to win, but because he wants Hillary Clinton to lose. He is really voting against the greater of two evils. Conversely, maybe the voter in question really, really liked the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, and wanted her to win. But recognizing that the Green Party is simply not going to win, this voter will engage in strategic voting and choose between the two front runners according to which one the voter finds to be the least offensive. So in this case, let's say that the voter doesn't like either Trump or Clinton, but really, 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 really hates Donald Trump. Then this voter will vote for Hillary Clinton, even though the voter doesn't like Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton is preferable to Donald Trump. And the voter is afraid that if she does not cast her vote for Hillary Clinton, that if she casts it for Jill Stein, that might spoil Hillary Clinton's chance of defeating Donald Trump. In which case, Donald Trump will defeat Hillary Clinton and become the president, which is a zero-sum outcome, which is the worst possible outcome for this Jill Stein voter who wants Jill Stein to win, but would prefer Clinton to Trump. Conversely, a voter who would like to vote for Gary Johnson, but would prefer Trump to Hillary Clinton, will probably vote for Donald Trump, not Gary Johnson, because he's afraid that if he does vote for Gary Johnson, that will take a vote from Donald Trump, and that, in turn, will help Hillary Clinton to defeat Trump, and that would be the worst possible outcome for the Gary Johnson voter. So this is strategic voting, and it's incentivized by our plurality system, which is why, as per Duverger's law, we are going to find that countries with simple plurality or majority rule elections, which are going to be conducted according to a winner-takes-all system, will tend towards having exactly two parties. Of course, if we're going to find that there's a Duverger's law describing what happens when you use a plurality system, you might not be surprised to learn that there's also what we call Duverger's tendency. And Duverger's tendency tells us that other electoral systems, in particular proportional electoral systems, will tend to create multi-party systems. A multi-party system is a party system in which you have more than two viable parties competing for control over the government. So remember, in our majoritarian or plurality, our winner-takes-all electoral system, we are going to give candidates an opportunity to run against one another. And then voters are going to cast ballots for which of these candidates they like, and the candidate who gets the most votes will win. The candidate who gets the second most votes goes home, gets nothing, does not receive a participation trophy, does not pass go, does not collect $300. But there's an alternative used in certain countries like Ireland or Israel, and this is the proportional electoral system. In a proportional electoral system, we're going to find that parties, not candidates, run for election. Voters don't choose between candidates, they choose between parties. So a proportional system is an electoral system in which parties gain seats in proportion to the number of votes cast for them. So let's say, for example, that we have a system like this in the United States in some hypothetical alternate reality. And we're going to say that we're going to decide which political party controls the United States Senate based on the percent of votes each of the parties received. There are 100 seats in the United States Senate. So let's say that we are voting between Republicans, Democrats, and Libertarians. Republicans and Democrats each have about 40% of the general population in their camp, whereas the Libertarian Party only has about 20%. Now that Libertarian Party obviously is never going to gain a majority seats in the Senate, but if they got 20% of the vote, that means they would get 20 out of 100 of the seats in the United States Senate whereas the Republicans and Democrats would each get 40 for a total of 80 between them. Now understand that that still means that four-fifths of the Senate is going to be controlled by Republicans and Democrats, 
But that gives the Libertarians one-fifth of the Senate, and that's a lot better than what they would get in a plurality, winner-takes-all, or majoritarian democracy like ours. Because remember, right now we don't have any Libertarians in our government. We don't have really any independents in our government. But if we were to use a proportional system, that probably wouldn't be true. We would not be limited to our two-party system. So at this point, you should understand Duverger's law. You should know the difference between plurality and proportional electoral systems, and you should understand that our use of plurality systems is the number one most important factor explaining why the two parties tend to dominate in our country, even though they are outnumbered by independents in the general population. But if you're having trouble with any of these concepts, I will again upload a series of videos and links that can help to illustrate things like Duverger's Law, Strategic Voting, Plurality, and Proportional Elections with some visual aids that might help you to wrap your mind around these concepts before you begin taking our quizzes, completing our assignments or tests for this week. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let it off there. And I thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I'll see you when we get back. Bye.